Good morning. So good to be with you folks today. We appreciate uh, the invitation from the eldership. Uh, we have several from Queen City uh, here with us. Um, they have their traveling preacher. For some reason, they still decided to come, uh, even though I was the one going to be preaching this morning. Um, but we appreciate the time we got to spend yesterday with the eldership, and um, we so appreciate this congregation and the work that you do and all the, the things that you are planning to do in the future and that you are currently doing uh, for God and His kingdom. We thank you so much for your sacrificial giving so far as the work is concerned at Queen City. We appreciate your support and we covet your prayers. Um, if you didn't get a chance to meet some of our brethren, they're right down to the front here. Uh, if they look strange, it's because they're from Cincinnati, right? You can pick them out really easily. Uh, but please uh, make time to meet them and, and, and talk with them and get to know who they are. Um, we, we just love the fact that we can be here and, and be with you good brethren, right? Sometimes in the Bible, there are things that are jarring. They are somewhat, they, they catch your attention. They're really strange when you come across some of these things in Scripture. And you may have read some of this if you're a Bible reader uh, or if you've spent some time in the church, uh, but it's still shocking nonetheless. In Isaiah chapter 20, God tells Isaiah that I want you to lie on your left side for about 390 days, at the end of which you would lie on your right side for about 40 days. And you're like, what's up with that? Why, why, is, uh, why is Isaiah supposed to be lying for 300 and odd days on one side and then 40 days on the other? God is in the habit of using illustrations, pictures, if you may, walking illustrations. In Ezekiel chapter 4, this one is also kind of, you know, strange. Uh, this whole idea about walking around naked. And uh, Isaiah was the one walking around naked. Ezekiel is the one who is, is there, and God tells him to, to cook his, his food using human waste. And Ezekiel says, I have never touched anything unclean in all my life. And God said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a substitution here. You can use maybe an animal dung, and you can use that as your fuel to cook with. And, and you're, you're standing there, and you're going, uh, the prophets are walking around naked. They are lying down on one side. Uh, what's going on? And it's, it's that same response is what God was looking for, to get the attention of his people. Imagine seeing one of the prophets walking around naked, Days on end, bare feet, without any clothes on. And you, you're not used to seeing him like that. And you're like, what's going on? Well, God is trying to get his people to wake up because of the conditions that abound. Sometimes it was to illustrate very vividly, you're going to be punished. You're going to be stripped down. You're going to be hungry, or you might be taken into captivity in chains without any clothes on. Hosea gets our attention as well, because God tells the prophet to go and, and, and marry someone who is, and depending on the version that you're reading, it's, it's very graphic. You hear a prostitute, you hear harlot, you hear whoredom, you know, and, and they're, they're even worse when you start thinking about it. Uh, women of the night, um, sexual workers, depending on what version you're reading. And God says to his prophet, his prophet from North Israel, who is a godly man as far as we can tell, and he says, I want you to look out there, and of all the women that you can choose, that's the one I want you to, to marry. An unfaithful woman. 
And by the way, you're going to have children with this woman, some of which are not going to be your own. The first one is ascribed to Hosea, but the other two seem to be in chapter 1 ascribed to other men. And, and, and you start looking at that and you're, you're like, what's going on? Why are you asking this of your prophet? Why are you making this man go through this pain and this turmoil and this heartbreak? And this is just scratching the surface. You know, chapter 1 talks about in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And then you read about Jeroboam, king of Israel, and then you're like, okay, how come we have two kings? Well, you, go, you, you kind of step back to see how we actually get here. And in stepping back, it would explain why things are the way they are in this book. I think it's necessary. Right, so walk with me a little bit through the Bible's history. You go back to first Samuel chapter 8, and you have Samuel who is old. There's nothing wrong in being old, but he has sons who are vile and wicked and unrestrained. And the people of Israel come to Samuel and they say, you know, you're old and your sons are wicked and they accept briberies. We want a king. We want what the other nations have. Well, that's not the solution. The solution was simply find some, some other priest or prophets. Not throw out the, uh, is it a baby with the proverbial bath water? You don't, you, don't, you don't throw all that stuff out. The solution is get rid of Samuel's sons. So it seems as if Israel was also using this as an excuse to really get what they wanted all along. We want to throw off these restraints. You see, God is, is ruling. He, it's a theocracy. But we don't want God to rule because he's too restrictive. He's uh, all these do's and don'ts. We want what everybody else has. We want a king. So God gave them Saul. Well, Saul was not the best king. You read in 1 Samuel chapter 13, the armies are squared up against the Philistines. And it's customary to offer a burnt sacrifice and a peace offering before you go into battle. So here's Saul, he's waiting on Samuel the prophet, and it's about seven days he's waiting. And the army starts to disband. And Saul says, you know what? I'm going to take things into my own hands. And Saul, as soon as he offers the burnt offering and the peace offering, here comes Samuel. And Samuel says, what have you done, Saul? And Saul says, well, I waited. I waited and you didn't show up. You can find an excuse to break God's law. In fact, you can find any excuse to break God's law. That's what Saul did. You read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, when Saul was told to destroy all the Amalekites. And I'm not going to get into the ethics of that chapter. We won't have time this morning to discuss that. But God says, destroy man, woman, children, animals. Do not spare anything. And here comes Samuel, and, and, and Saul greets him, and Saul says, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Samuel goes, what's this noise that I'm hearing? You know, I, I, hear, I hear oxen mowing, and I hear sheep bleating. And Saul goes, well, it's the people. The people wanted a sacrifice. They wanted to do something good. You know, how, how could you destroy? The, this is good. Good sheep. Good oxen. But God said, 
destroy all of it. And here Saul keeps going, but I have obeyed the voice of, of the Lord. And Samuel says something so interesting. If you, if you read it so many times, it's easy to skip over. He says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. You guys know that part. But did you see what else Samuel says? He says your stubbornness is as witchcraft and your rebellion as idolatry. Stubbornness and rebellion equals idolatry and witchcraft? Is that how God looks at stubbornness and rebellion? As if I'm bowing down to some idol or I am consulting a witch or a medium or necromancy or something. That's how God saw Saul's disobedience or partial obedience, if you may. Samuel told Saul what Saul needed to hear. And Saul needed to hear what Samuel had to say. Sometimes we need to hear what the Lord has to say. And it may not be pleasant, it may not be nice, but it is absolutely necessary. And then you read about David, when, when Saul is rejected, here comes Samuel, he comes into David's house, Jesse's, his father's in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I think it's verse 4. Here is Samuel and Jesse brings his eldest, Eliab. And, 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 and Samuel is looking, you know, from head to toe and he says, Surely, surely the Lord's anointed. And God said to Samuel, do not look at his stature or at his height. For God does not look at things the way man does. The Lord looks at the heart. What troubles me about this text is this, that, that Jesse didn't think about David. He thought about Eliab and all the other sons. He didn't think about calling David. I think there's a lesson there somehow for parents, maybe, that how we look at our children. We have to be ever so careful that to, to kind of judge them equally and treat them equally. You know, I tell my, our two children, Emily's my favorite daughter, and Joshua is my favorite son. You know, I have favorites. Emily is my favorite daughter. And for those of you who don't know, she's my only daughter. Because you might be saying, how could the preacher say that? And, and for those of you who don't know, Joshua is my only son. Right? So there's something there. But you know how David's story ends? 2 Samuel chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 24. All you think about David is Uriah, Bathsheba, he numbers Israel, and, and the sword never leaves his house. You read some of the ugliest stories in biblical history, it's in David's house. A man after God's own heart. And then we get Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3. And Solomon starts out fairly good. But then you get to chapter 11, and it says in verse 1 through 4 that he loved many foreign wives. Chapter 3, he's in love with God. There's something that went wrong from chapter 3 to chapter 11. This love that he once had for God is now misdirected somewhere else. And you read in 1 Kings chapter 11 and about verse 40, somewhere around there, the prophet comes to Jeroboam, he takes off his coat, he tears it up into pieces, and he gives Jeroboam 10 pieces of those, that cloth. 
And he says, these are the tribes that the Lord is giving you. But Jeroboam doesn't want to wait. He is too anxious, too eager. So he goes up north, and we have those ten tribes that we call Israel, sometimes Ephraim. And we have two tribes that stay down south. And that's why you have this division that we read about in Hosea and other places. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah are kings of Judah. Jeroboam the second is the reigning king in Israel. Incidentally, this is one of the most prosperous times in Israel. Hosea is contemporary with Amos. Amos tells us that people had summer houses when it was too cold, and they had winter houses when it was, you know, too hot. Nothing wrong in having a summer house or winter house. The problem is, that's all they were focusing on. You had a couch or a bed made out of ivory. You had women who were reclining on, on chairs and drinking out of goblets, wine. And, and they were telling their, their husbands, you know, bring me more drink. Affluence, prosperity, and, and religion was reduced to a show. They were offering, they were showing up at the temple, they were sacrificing, but it was all for show. And this is where Hosea comes in. Hosea is describing to Israel and to us why God is going to lead Israel into Assyrian captivity in 721 BC. And what I want us to do today is this. Let's look at the book and see how God describes his people and see if any of those descriptions match us. And if they do, what we can do about it. And if they don't, well, you can just say amen and keep going, right? So very briefly in the couple minutes that I have left, Hosea describes God's people in several pictorial concepts. The first one is the unfaithful wife. The unfaithful spouse. And I don't mean to bring back up any challenges that maybe some of you had in, in that area. That's not my intention to re-traumatize you in any way if you've dealt with this. But in Hosea's chapters 2, 4, and 9, you see Hosea's wife, Goma, leave Hosea at home, leave the children at home, and goes running off for other men. They're described as lovers in the book. In fact, things get so bad in chapter 2, she has sold herself into prostitution. She's now a, a, a sexual worker. And Hosea has to go and buy his wife back. And he does. First of all, I don't know what... what what type of individual, what man today, what father or what mother would want their sons marrying someone like Goma to begin with? There is some challenge with the text. We have scholars who say, well, she wasn't a prostitute at the time or she was predisposed to become one. I, I, I think that's all a nonsense. The text doesn't say that. The text says, go and marry a woman who's a harlot. Right? And it's describing God's people. Israel wasn't something to be aspiring that you wanted. Israel was no special or peculiar people. Read Deuteronomy chapter 7. That's what you see. God chose them because he decided to. He wanted to. 
And I could only imagine the pain of a husband after he marries his wife and she goes running off to someone else. And, and then he has to go look for her. And when he finds her, he has to pay money to buy her from, you know, the institution to bring her back home. And God was describing Israel. Chapter 2, uh, you read expressions like, She said, my lovers gave me my oil, my wine, my flax, my wool, my water. Everything that God had provided, what Israel was doing, they were taking all of those provisions and giving it to Baal, an idol. All God's blessings were being poured at the foot of an idol. To contextualize that in today's concept, Ephesians chapter 5, husbands are told to love their wives just as Christ loves the church. That the church is the bride of Christ. So that means you and, 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 you and me, we, those of us who are members of the church, are married to Christ. Is it humanly possible at times that we can become like Goma? That we can break the Lord's heart. That we can take his blessings and his love and his trust and his care and, and his provisions and all of this and, and take it at a an idol's feet. And I know you might be saying, Brother Singh, hold on. We don't have idols today. We don't bow down to idols today. Well, maybe we should back up a little bit. What might people say we are married to? You see, I've heard people describe other individuals like this. Oh, he's married to his job. Oh, he's married to his sport. Oh, he's married, you probably heard this one, he's married to the television, <laughs> right? Or, or he's married, you know, and whatever. And what that, that is describing is, is where they pour their energy and their time and their money and all of it. James, we saw in Bible class in chapter 4 and verse 4, call Christians adulterers and adulteresses that they had violated the sacred oath that they took the day they became Christians. And I could just imagine how God feels when we are unfaithful to him. You want to know what breaks the Lord's heart? His people. Sometimes it's his people. Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's me. Hosea describes God's people as an unfaithful wife. Could that be describing you? Hosea also describes God's people as a stubborn heifer. For those of you younger people who don't know what a heifer is, it's a cow, right? A stubborn cow. Where I was raised, we had a small farm, about 20 acres, and we had we had cows, and some of them were heifers. And if you saw the heifer, sometimes it's really hard to train the heifer to do what it should do. You're pulling this way, and the heifer is running that way. Right? And try as you may, as strong as you think you are, that heifer is going to go where it wants to go. God's people in chapter 4 in Hosea were running to Assyria, the same nation that would take them into captivity, for help, or they were running to Egypt, the house of bondage, for help. Where they weren't running was to God. Every which way, but not God. I think about Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, where Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man to walk, to direct his path or his steps. 
that God has a path, a line, a way for us to live, and sometimes we want to do what we want to do. Well, like Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And the wise man repeats it again in chapter 16 and verse 25. Or well, I think about Proverbs 13 and verse 15. The way of the transgressor is hard. Sin might seem appealing. It might seem sophisticated. But in the end, it's hard. You know, we were on vacation a couple days ago, and you see these people down there with the, the drinks. I've never seen drinks that big before. You, you needed two hands to hold it. You know, you pick that stuff up so, and is what was it? Painkiller or something. I'm like, a painkiller is a drink? I know you have Advil for pain. I mean, you're going to get more pain if you drink alcohol. <laughs> What's going on with the world, Right? And, and, and they, you know, they're sipping back and they, they have this nice, I can't do the pose, I don't know how to do it. They were posing, right? Real sophistication. And that's what, you know, success looks like. No, it doesn't. In the night, it's a little different story. You're going to hear somebody throwing up. Or the next morning, you're going to see them when they hang over. That's what you see. Or you're going to see the homes wrecked. Or you're going to see somebody driving on a highway who shouldn't be driving. Right? God's people were called heifers. I think about Amos, chapter 4 and chapter 6. They were called cows. I mean, if the preacher called you a cow, that's the last sermon he's going to preach. <laughs> really? I could just imagine... You know, Amos standing there, and I'm like, what? My jaw is going to drop. What did you just call me? A cow? Did he lose his mind? What's going on with him? Right? God's people are described in, in, in Hosea, especially chapter 7. There are four illustrations. One is a burnt cake. Apparently, the cake wasn't turned when it should have been turned. Or the cake was mixed with ingredients that shouldn't be in it. I think God is describing Israel as mixing with the nations round about, and they should not have, because they allow those nations to now influence them. And as a result, they lost their identity. I mean, this is in Hosea, in the 735 B.C., and God was talking to his people about maintaining their identity. Today, we need to hear some of this. We are in an identity crisis sometimes. You think about the church, and you talk to people and you say, well, I'm from the church of Christ. You know what they ask me sometimes? Which one? Should there ever be a question like that? Which one? There should never be a question like that, but there is because that's where we are. Which one? What's the one that is trying to live by this book? You think about Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Jesus says, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many people on that road. Or Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. You know, after Paul talks about, I beseech you by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, he talks about don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world take you and pour you into its mold. If anybody was around here yesterday, there was a huge um, march down the street at the end of Washington Avenue, and it seemed as if it's a lot of people, but it isn't. And, and we, we don't hate people. We, we, we want to reach people. We want to help people. God does not hate people. His son died on the cross for all people. But sometimes we are bent on doing what we want to do as opposed to what God wants to do. We allow the world to mix us. 
and we lose our identity. I hope that we, we, we are determined more than ever to remain true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's people is also, they are also described as an old person. And I know this is a little strange one. An old person in Hosea chapter 7. And it seems to imply that an old person is not aware that they are old. That they have forgotten or they have lost touch with reality. And you're like, oh, that's a head scratcher. Why would God call Israel an old person or like an old person? They're not aware of where they are. You know, I play the occasional basketball uh, sometimes. And I used to play much differently than I play now. Especially when I'm playing against these two. It used to be that I could get around or I can guard. Now I am reduced to cheating. <laughs> Pushing and pulling and shoving and kicking anywhere to win. Because as you get older, you realize you're slower. And you, you, know, you can't move as quickly. Apparently, that's what take, is taking place. Israel didn't realize the reality of what's going on around them. They were living in a make-believe world. You ever see those people? They're 95 years old and they're trying to dress like they're 15. We don't have any of those this morning, I guarantee you. But it seems to be that's what Israel was dealing with. They forgot the reality of the conditions around them. Israel is also described as a silly dove, a bird, hopping around from branch to branch, down Egypt, Assyria, you know, all over the place. Israel is also described as a broken bow and arrow. When you pull that bow, it's supposed to go this way, it was going anywhere but where it should be. Imagine pulling the arrow this way and the bow is going that way. Or this way. Or you're trying to shoot up and it's pointing down. Apparently the idea here is that Israel lost a sense of direction. They weren't sure where they were and where they should be. Where they should be heading was this way, trusting in God, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. And, and finally, Israel is described as a rebellious, stubborn son. In chapter 11, verse 1, 2, and 3. I think God looked down and he said, I provided, I cared for, I trained, I was present. And like the son or sons in Luke chapter 15, the one that said to his father, give me my inheritance so that I might go and enjoy life. And went into a far country and squandered all that his father gave him and ended up in the pig pen of all places. Then he realized what he had home. And he says, I will go to my father, and I would say to my father, Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And on his way home, his father was out there looking for him, looking, trying to see where his son was. And as, his, as that son spots his father and the father sees the son, he goes running to his son. And before his son could say anything, the father embraces him and he calls for the ring, he calls for the robe, and he says, kill the fatted calf. My son who was lost is now found. My son who was dead is now alive. God was looking for Israel to come back home as a father would look for his children. It might be today that you're not where you should be. That your relationship is not what it once was. 
You can rectify, you can remedy that right now. Or it might be that you're not a Christian. You've never repented of your sins or confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, or be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. Don't do like Drusilla and Felix when they heard Paul preach about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. In Acts chapter 24 and verse 25, Felix says, Go thy way when I have a more convenient time I will call for you. Don't let convenience give way to conviction. If you need to respond to the gospel message, please come forward as we stand and sing.